So we all have more than a passing familiarity with architecture. Buildings in a very direct way um, affect the way we move through space. They surround us, we enter them, we engage with them um, on a daily basis. Um, in one sort of wearing one professional hat at the moment, I have a job where I work with an architectural historian and one of his first questions that he asks students on a yearly basis is, is there a difference between building and architecture? Is there a difference between building and architecture? And he's addressing this rather loaded question to a group of very unprepared 18-year-olds who sort of panic and say, no, they're exactly the same. Um, but I think it's, it's a more interesting question that. So do have a think while we're going through these slides whether you agree that you know buildings and architecture are the same or whether you think that there's a difference between buildings and architecture. And I think arguably some of those differences, if they're there, might occur when we move from thinking about buildings or architecture in two dimensions to three dimensions. Um, so I have up, rather helpfully, the Pantheon um, in Rome, just because I like it, and I think that it's, um, it's one of the kind of most well-known examples of architecture, capital A, in that canon of um, classical vocabulary. Um, so I thought we'd start with the Pantheon. It's a building that we can still experience in a very direct way. We can walk inside it, we can engage with it. Um, began as a pagan temple, later converted to a Christian church, and now predominantly a tourist destination, arguably, although mass is still celebrated. As you can see in that very unsubtle first slide of the lecture way, I have given you both a three-dimensional and a two-dimensional version of the Pantheon, just to get your eye in, to, to show you that buildings can in fact coexist in two dimensions and in three dimensions. Although, and I'm quite sure some of you are thinking, but everything here is two-dimensional because that's a photograph. So before any of you raise that point, yes, we often engage with three dimensions as two dimensions unless we're sort of physically teaching on site. Italian theme. So moving from the Pantheon, which is uh, this kind of archetypal piece of, of architecture, capital A, to the Vatican, which again um, has a function as an iconic building as a piece of architecture that is used as a cultural epicentre for the Roman Catholic Church. The current building that you see is incredibly well known, um, arguably highly recognisable to anybody kind of interested in the church. Um, I was in Rome just after Easter and just before the two um, beatifications and it felt like the entire world was in Rome that week exploring the Vatican so this was a space that was very crowded and that beautiful piazza that you can see there was full of people you could barely see the space for all of the people moving through it but the Vatican in its physical presence is extremely recognizable but what you might not know is that this Renaissance version of this building replaces a much earlier example. So the Vatican as is, is built on the site of Old St. Peter's, which is a basilica begun under Constantine, dating to around the 4th century in Rome. Um, architecture changes. Architecture is a piece of social production. Um, there are people who would stand here and argue that if you want to look at a society, look at its architecture, because that's there that you get a piece of communication from that society, almost divorced of um, some of the propaganda and bias that you might get in written texts. I'm not sure it's true, personally, that buildings don't lie. I think they can. I think they can be used for functions and purposes. Um, and certainly, they do all have stories to tell. But Old St Peter's no longer there to be engaged with as a, as a physical space. We can't visit it, we can't walk through it, um, but we can engage with it from um, engravings and contextual drawings. So going into the Vatican, going under the Vatican, actually, is rather kind of a piece of conceptual engineering. So 
to think about going under the Vatican is actually to go back in time as well as to go into a different space. Um, because while some of you may know that the Vatican was built over Old St. Peter's, it was kind of famously um, taken apart by Bramante, earning him the nickname Bramante Ruinanti at the time. Um, the whole thing, the earlier basilica as well, was constructed over a pagan necropolis, a city of the dead. Um, so today, with lots of forward planning and plenty of begging emails to the Vatican, um, to the Scarby office, you can in fact visit the necropolis under the Vatican, the excavations, um, which you can see in the plan view here. Um, but not many people know that that option's there. Um, I would ask for a show of hands at this point, normally, of people who've been to the Vatican's Garvey, but I'm playing with a stacked deck, so I'm not going to bother, because I know that at least two people in this room have been, so my point will be lost. But normally, I get a very kind of pleasant, oh no, haven't, haven't heard about that response. So, um, for most people, if they hear about the necropolis at all, if they hear about the Scarvey at all, it will be through plans and and kind of architectural drawings, which can reveal hidden facets of buildings that you might not be aware of even when you're walking into these spaces, even as you're walking through St. Peter's. And finally, before we leave the Vatican, having demonstrated that, you know, plans have things to tell us, drawings of buildings have things to tell us, as do the buildings themselves, I just wanted to show you this, which is, of course, a set of stamps sold by the Vatican Post Office. The Vatican is very, very good at self-promoting its own narratives. And I was fascinated that they're choosing to do so in this instance, in 1986, through making this very odd spatial cutout of Vatican City. They have quite literally drawn Vatican City, placed the wall around it, and popped it onto this set of stamps, um, which are then going to be torn up put on your postcards and sent throughout the world. So you're getting a little piece of Vatican City to send where you will. But I was very intrigued that they're doing it through this coherently mapped space, which floats entirely divorced of the rest of the city of Rome. Vatican City exists in this instance on that white ground outside of time and space. Sticking with Rome, there's a theme until about 15 minutes before the end, and then it goes to pot, I'm afraid. But sticking with Rome for now, um, I'm going to take you to um, the Church of Santa Constanza, the mausoleum of Santa Constanza, which again roughly dates to the 4th century, and again, oh so subtle, I have given you the aerial view of the, of the architecture as is, and a plan view, so both two and three dimensions at work. But we're going to stick with three dimensions to start with. Um, anyone, no, see, not the people I know have been there, but has anyone else visited this church? Okay, at the back. So it's the most kind of incredible space, actually, because to get to it, you need to have probably negotiated a tram route that's not that clear in Rome. And then you need to kind of find yourself one church, walk up the hill and around the corner, and then you arrive at Santa Constanza. So it's not an obvious space from the outside of this complex. It's not something that kind of rises to greet you like the Vatican. It's not something that engages with a kind of pedestrian awareness of it as a building. You have to be looking for it. You need to kind of know what you're looking for when you're setting out to engage with it. Having said that, if you are ever attempting to go, just be kind of wary because it's incredibly popular as a wedding venue and I can count on almost two hands the number of times I've turned up to try and visit and been swamped by Italian weddings and brides and photographers. Quite disappointing. But once you've kind of got there, once you've found this kind of circular building up the hill and round the corner from Sant'Agnese outside the walls, um, you find yourself in a really extraordinary space. So it's a centrally planned structure, um, and let's just pop back to that plan view so you can have a look. Centrally planned, um, although it does have the shape of a cross running through its centre, through the way the columns are aligned. They sort of leave a gap for this cross to go all the way through the outer ambulary and hit niches. 
So it's architecture that's been thought through. It's quite clever in the way it plays with space. But when you're inside it, it's quite hard to see it. In fact, I had been in there probably four times before I saw the plan and realised that the cross was in fact there at all. Santa Constanza, as with so many of the buildings in Rome, has survived partially complete from its earlier articulations in that a lot of its decoration has been lost. So the dome that you're looking up at, and again, trickery of two dimensions and photographs, you can sort of see the dome over the central drum in a way that it's not that easy to photograph if you actually stood there. So this is the outer ambulatory that you would walk all the way around. This is the central space. And then through the magic of photography, you're almost looking up in a straight line to the dome, just to orient you on that slide. Um, it's a really beautiful church in that it still retains some of its 4th century mosaics, but some of them have been lost. The dome would have had a mosaic programme. If any of you have far better Italian than I do, there's a very good description of, of kind of what the Italians think this mosaic may have been. Um, they think that the dome was decorated with stars and the drum leading up to it was a scene of pagan temples with gods and goddesses and a river full of silver fish. So it would have been incredibly beautiful, this kind of blue and silver cosmos with this kind of blue and silver architectural articulation running down. And it would sort of have led you in a very direct way from the earthly to the heavenly, because as you can see, maybe, um, the mosaics around the outer ambulatory are much less heavenly ostensibly in their articulation. You have geometric shapes, you have um, a Bacchic harvest, and you have perhaps one of my very favourite early Christian mosaics, well, Roman, is it early Christian being one of the major questions of Santa Constanza's iconography, um, of kind of urns and flowers and birds. They're the most incredibly beautifully articulated birds. I say that there's a kind of ambiguity to the iconography here, and there is. Everything can be read in two ways. It can be read in a kind of pagan way, and it can be read in a Christian way, which is perhaps fitting for an imperial mausoleum um, at a time when Christianity is not fully accepted in the city of Rome itself. So the ambiguity in, in the mosaic work is perhaps nothing too um, astonishing here. However, in the entirety of the mosaic program that we have left, and this is where I'm going to put my sort of slightly geeky art historical hat on, there are two borders that are different from any other border in that church. Um, those of you who know me, apologies for the repetition, um, but for quite a while I have been interested in the borders that surround mosaic programmes. And quite a bit of my wider research is about the presence of borders with jewels on running around the edges of mosaic programmes, arguing that if you get a jewelled border, what that border does, in fact, is articulate the space of the heavenly Jerusalem through the analogous passage in Revelations where you get the city of God described as bejeweled with walls of gold and you get a list of um, 12 gemstones forming the city of God. So when you get these borders with jewels, I think it actively transforms the space of the earthly architecture into the walls of heaven. And there are only two sections of jeweled border that survive at Santa Constanza. And you can see them there. Now the interesting thing for me at Santa Constanza isn't necessarily that they're there, actually, because they're fairly ubiquitous to many mosaic programmes. It's the way they engage with the rest of the architecture of the space. So just to give you a cross-section as well, and this is where architectural drawings can be incredibly helpful in letting us see aspects of buildings that either don't exist anymore, as with the decoration, or that are very hard to see in situ. Um, the jeweled borders, which on this drawing would be here, hit the building at the point where there is a raised tower, where that outer ambulary actually goes up, and there's a much more definite vertical emphasis 
than at any other point on that ambulatory axis, um, which is, I think is really significant. I've told you that this was an imperial mausoleum um, for Constantine's daughter, and it's thought that the imperial sarcophagus would have been placed possibly underneath that tower space where the building gives up, literally, onto the heavens, where it gets much higher. There is a kind of sense of heightened architectural significance that is um, kind of out of character for the rest of the symmetry and harmony that you find in Santa Constanza as a space. Something significant is going on there. Courtesy of a 16th century drawing, um, sadly anonymous, we sort of have the most tantalising glimpse of what the iconography might have been. So I've walked you very quickly through the theory that a jeweled border might mean the heavenly Jerusalem, might mean that we're thinking about an iconography of the city of God. And I've told you that the iconography of Santa Constanza is sort of split between pagan and Christian. And I've told you that in the dome there's a cosmos with a silver river and fish and boats and pagan gods and goddesses in the kind of very public, um, large-scale dome. But then in this other point of the building, this other point of vertical significance, um, there is this very tantalising iconography, which only exists in this drawing. However, you can see that the birds are incredibly well represented that are there. It's a very accurate depiction of the birds on the ambulatory mosaic. So you can see, hopefully, that there is architecture that possibly looks a little like a church, and there is a lamb with a halo. If you know a bit about early Christian iconography, this sort of building with the Agnus Dei in front of it could absolutely be read as a paradisal or Jerusalemic landscape, which would sort of tie in with the fragments we have left um, and would, of course, be extremely interesting in terms of what's going on with the rest of the iconographic programme. But these arguments can only be made because of this two-dimensional drawing that we have. So incredibly significant. And that is just a close-up of some of the other mosaic work and a better shot of that jeweled border next to the anonymous drawing. And you can see, I think, that it's quite a faithful depiction of the birds. Okay, moving on. And we're sort of going backwards and forwards, well, mainly forwards, um, in time here. <coughs> so we have a consular diptych of Ariabindus, the ivory, and we also have a double folio page from an illuminated manuscript that comes from Anglo-Saxon England um, in the 8th century. And you might be thinking, why are you putting these on the same slide? And it's not just because they both coherently preserve articulations of two-dimensional architecture in very different ways, although they do. It's to do with a theory of viewing um, that might have been um, active in Anglo-Saxon England and that might let us kind of think a little bit about how space might be perceived, how architecture and space might be actualised for the medieval mind. Before we get there, it's probably really important to note that a lot of the way we think about space and perspective and privileging architecture and space um, is ruled by a kind of renaissance eye, actually, since the advent of perspective, um, that has been king. Um, mathematical perspective kind of was born in the renaissance, and since then it's been the arbiter of sophisticated space. If it has perspective, it must be correct and clever and the most sophisticated articulation it can possibly be. And certainly perspective allows for some incredibly intricate spaces to be placed on a two-dimensional surface. Um, these illusory, fictive spaces that sort of run back from the two-dimensional surfaces of the canvases, giving us this sort of very directly actualized interior that we can almost feel like we can enter, feel like we can engage with. However, despite their sophistication, despite their ubiquity, in fact, as art historians in the way that we construct sophisticated space, I'm not convinced that it's the be-all and end-all. So I wanted to, to spend a bit of time tonight thinking about the potential of um, non-perspectival space 
which nonetheless is viewed from the point of an active and contemplative mindset. So can you, in fact, view a non-perspectival image with all of the sophistication and complexity that we would normally expect from a perspectival composition? Little composite slide that I put together suggesting that yes, of course, yes, of course you can do that because perspective is, is only one possible manner through which to show space and um, probably best not to have started by saying I came from a fine art background before showing you this diagram actually, but you can see a very dodgy little drawing of three houses in um, absolutely non-perspectival um, articulations and then you can also see a, a, the same three houses in fact drawn in perspective, single point perspective and then you can see three houses in 3D so they're the same kind of concept just represented differently. And I thought just to get your eye in before we start doing the kind of ticky tacky sciencey stuff um, I'd give you a set of images two dimensional and three dimensional um, from a medieval insular milieu that might get you thinking about how space works. So you've got the plan view of the Holy Sepulchre from De Locus Sanctus um, put together around the 8th century. You have a very um, sort of complex interlace pattern here that's really playing with the idea of negative space, pulling the eye forwards and backwards through this interlace pattern. You have a little bit of the crypt at Hexham, which if anyone's visited the Anglo-Saxon crypts at Hexham, they really do play with space in the way that they move you through them as a body. They have twists and turns and corridors that seem like dead ends before they open out into the central chamber. And then you have a modern reconstruction of what the church at Jarrow may have looked like, fully articulated in perspective. So that's what you're looking at there. This, of course, is different. This is not perspectival at all. This comes from the Codex Amiatinus, um, the facsimile of which is currently either back or on its way back to Jarrow. So if any of you are feeling like a road trip, that's extremely special and you should... Oh, apparently it's there. So you should think about visiting while it's here. Um, the reason I say this is extremely special, it was, it was made in, in Jarrow in the 8th century. In fact, three of these monstrous codexes were made. This one um, was sent to Rome as a gift for the Pope, although it never made it. It currently lives in Florence, and it's enormous. It takes two people to lift it, and one scholar famously described it as weighing the same amount as a fully grown female Great Dane. So we're not talking about a small book here. The tabernacle diagram is really interesting. So there are three full-page illuminated miniatures in this book. This is a double folio, which is rare in itself in Anglo-Saxon art, but originally it wasn't bound into the manuscript, so it could be picked up, lifted out, put elsewhere, and turned around. You could engage with it outside the confines of the structure of the book. It shows you... Um, the courtyard of Solomon's temple with the Holy of Holies, and it does so in both aerial and plan view. Can everybody see that? Because I'm telling you now that for four years, I could not. I could see columns, I could see a structure, I could maybe see a courtyard, and I could see an altar, but for the life of me, I couldn't quite work out how this space wanted me to look at it. And there's a lot of scholarship that's written saying, matter-of-factly, incredibly sophisticated, drawn in both plan and aerial view, um, as if it's easy to see this. And I did not think it was easy. So we went quite literally outside the box, and I had my dad make this, which exists in plan view, but lifts up the bits that are in elevation. So you can sort of hopefully see that there is a plan of this courtyard, but it would almost, in your mind, let you walk through that space. It would let you encounter the objects described as being in the courtyard outside the Holy of Holies 
in the processional order that you would have encountered them, and it would have let you conceptually go inside the Holy of Holies itself to engage with the temple treasures. So it's quite a sophisticated piece of um, visual imaging, which is neither really in two dimensions or in three. So if we think about the sort of contextual and conceptual mindset that we know um, the intellectual elite of the early Christian Anglo-Saxon world were um, engaging with, things like contemplative viewing, things like very sophisticated exegesis, the pulling apart of ideas and texts, and apply that to a visual image, I think there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that Anglo-Saxon viewers would have been capable of this sort of visual articulation, of actualising the space of the courtyard in their mind's eye in a much more immediate way than I was. I had to literally put this into multiple dimensions in order to understand it. Thinking about the temple, it's a space that gets a lot of attention, and I think um, probably not just me that gets fascinated with these articulations of, of the temple, the fact that people are continually rebuilding and appropriating this architectural space. So here you have a model um, constructed in Quebec, presented on television in 1966, um, published in 1967, incredibly detailed, um, just, yes, I'm, every time I see this I'm slightly speechless actually, but there are less, I don't know, models with less integrity, that's probably not the right word actually. So this is another set of very fascinating models of the temple. Um, constructed more recently um, in Alabama, in the States. Um, the same architectural historian I mentioned who talks about buildings and architecture, are they different, are they the same, actually lives in Mobile. And I keep meaning to say to him, could you go and see these for me? Could you please go and tell me if they are everything I hope they might be? Um, because this um, Doctor of Divinity have in fact made scale models of the temple and the tabernacle and the temple treasures and the kind of exegetical garments that we know the priests would have worn. And they look a little like this. Um, yeah. I mean, in terms... In terms of the sophistication of the Codex Amiatinus, that two-dimensional drawing that let you conceptually actualise the space of Solomon's temple, we're not playing the same game, really, are we? It's very different in terms of thinking through um, what a model is, what it can be, what it does, where it takes you. And in many ways, I think the two-dimensional image created in the 8th century um, might have more intellectual integrity than something which should be a much more direct interpretation, something that is in three dimensions, something which realises for us, that does the work for us, um, of reimagining this space. I'm going to hold my judgement until I've seen it, though, but I did want to flag up that there are models and then there are models. That's quite an important point, I think. So we're returning to the area of Indistiptych because this, like the, um, the Amiotinus tabernacle diagram, presents an incredibly complex space. So these diptychs were created to celebrate the inauguration of Roman consuls. We know that they were circulating in Anglo-Saxon England and were often reused, but nonetheless they were quite common objects. You can see, I hope, the consul enthroned up here um, watching the games below because three things happened at a consular inauguration. The consul was inaugurated, the ivory was produced in order to commemorate that inauguration and there was an inaugural game to celebrate. So we're working within a sort of trinity of object, event and kind of inauguration of the figure himself. So very typical of Orlic art, you have scale being used to give meaning to narrative here. You have the consul being um, represented as 
sort of almost two-thirds the size of this ivory. Um, you have the Roman people below him much smaller, and the games smaller still in the bottom lower third, an absolute kind of cacophony of movement and killing going on at the bottom. However, looking at this thing, again, I think it's much more complex than that. Remember that these are created to commemorate not just the games, but also the act of inaugurating a console. They're commemorating that kind of moment, that historical moment. Um, and they're going out into the world to do this. And I think there's a very complex sort of space that is shown here. So, um, just to give you a bit more of a close-up. You get the games absolutely coherently put in a semicircular frame, which is um, quite a shock, actually, visually, given that very rectilinear format of the rest of the ivory. Little model coming up again, no great surprise there. Um, but the semicircle is really important. It's no great surprise, I think, if you've ever visited a Colosseum or an arena. They are, in fact, um, quasi-circular or oval. Um, so to get that bend encircling the games perhaps isn't a surprise. However, bear with me, um, has everybody seen Gladiator? Anybody not seen Gladiator? Okay, well, you're about to see a clip from Gladiator, so I'm sorry if that's against your, your viewing principles, but bear with. So, the arena is something that everybody in that particular cultural context would have been aware of. The two things, the two kind of architectural structures that Romans bought when they bought, wrong word, built, when they first settled places were the Forum and the Arena. So it was kind of an absolutely iconic piece of Roman architecture. Um, and you would have known what it looked like. We today know what they look like, but mainly through tourism or watching things like Gladiator. So thank you, Russell. Um, so I thought we'd, yeah, I know, I know. It's, it's a problem. But we might also know about them through paintings. So 19th century, big interest in antiquities, um, lots of paintings like this produced, actually. So this is, um, and uh, I apologise in advance for my terrible pronunciation, but Pelice Verso, so the gesture of the thumb. Um, but I just want you to pay attention to the way that this 19th century painter is envisaging the arena. You can see that the arena wall has a slight curve. You can see that there is, in fact, a consular box with a throne you can see that it's a very busy space, it's very ornate. Um, and here is a, an even more grisly one showing similar tropes, actually, departure of the cats from the, from, the, from the circus. So this is in the aftermath of a games where the cats are being driven from the bodies. But I wanted to flag these up because we know that Ridley Scott was looking at these pictures when he was thinking about Gladiator. And the reason we know this is because it's an almost exact copy of the arena he actually produces in Gladiator. So if you think about Garone's Pelice Verso, and then think about Ridley Scott's actual articulation in his mind of what an Roman arena is, they're very similar. So I'm going to play you some Russell Crowe, but try not to get too distracted by the fight scenes and think about the space that you're in, please.
and stuff, I know, I know. Um, I did put in a second qu- second kind of film clip just in case we were running out of things to say, but I think we'll move on, actually, um, much as it pains me to do so. But it's thanks to these sort of epic pieces of cinema, which are nothing new, if you think about things like Ben-Hur, um, that we have a good awareness of the arena today, um, in a similar way to the way that there might have been a contemporary awareness of this space. It would have been one of those very ubiquitous spaces in the contemporary imagination. You would have been to an arena as a good Roman. And thus, I think, when you're looking at something like the Aryabindus diptych that presents you with a truncated game, that presents you with the back wall of the arena, I think that the space is something that's so known to you that you actualise it that instead of the sort of spatial awareness you get with perspective, where um, it's a fictive space that runs to a point, pulling back through the canvas, um, literally coming from um, Panofsky's reading of perspective, meaning, um, in fact, it's Panofsky taking from Jura, looking at perspectiva to see through, creating that fictive space of a window that you're looking through. Here, I think the space projects outwards. I think when you look at the space of the area of diptych, you know the space of the arena intimately and your brain connects to that back wall, putting you into the arena space a bit like that. So I think that in terms of actualising a two-dimensional space as a lived three-dimensional space, it's a pulling apart, a breaking apart, an effective reconstruction that literally breaks the frame of that diptych, placing you within that spatial construct, completing this notional arena. Important, I think, in an object that's produced to commemorate the inauguration, sent out to people who probably weren't there at the at the inauguration or at the games, but nonetheless let them participate in that event creates a sort of active engagement with, even in hindsight, kind of memorialising that moment. Okay, so I promised you postmodern as well as medieval, and that's where we're going next. So remember that we've sort of seen spaces that um, pull apart, spaces that are fictive, spaces that are actualised, and also we've seen architectural drawings that let us reclaim hidden histories or destroyed bits of buildings that we can't engage with today. This is different um, in a way, but this is um, Doho Su, who is a contemporary installation artist working with textile spaces. Um, Doho Su is very much interested in what it means to feel placeless as an immigrant, as someone who feels like they've lost touch with the idea of place and belonging and home, what then all other places and spaces feel like. And he creates these incredible ethereal installations that conjure spaces that do exist. We can walk through them, we can walk around them, but that there's always something that's a sort of barrier to that encounter, a barrier to this space. Um, It's a place, but it's a place that doesn't work. So in this um, staircase four, um, you get this beautiful kind of ceiling, you get this very detailed staircase descending from the ceiling, but you can't engage with it as its object identity. It's a staircase that doesn't work, you can't climb it. And yet, the details of Sue's work are incredibly, incredibly well observed. So you get things like fabric Um, plug sockets and light switches and kind of things that you feel like you should be able to engage with because they're so very real and yet they're always slightly unrealised in some way. So this is the perfect home Um, and I think the way that he works with kind of monochrome silks is really interesting. Um, You can sort of fill in for yourself where the period fireplace would be and what that might look like, what you might place on those shelves if this was your house. Um, And yet it's never going to exist. There's something incredibly intangible about these. And yet they're there. You walk through a gallery, you walk around them, you walk in them. 
fragile and beautiful and sort of almost dreamlike in a way. Um, the spaces that he picks as well are always those sort of slightly utilitarian, lived-in, flat-like spaces that most of us have lived in at one point or another. Um, places that might have an irony attached to them with a title like The Perfect Home. And yet you can see here perhaps the detail of the plumbing, and remember this is all silk and nylon, but the detail of the plumbing under the sink and the, cooker, the kind of cooker rings as well are just incredibly detailed. And there is the thermostat and the light switch that I mentioned earlier that you really do feel that you ought to be able to reach out and click a light on. Okay. Winding up oh so gently um, with Thomas Demand, who is another contemporary installation artist. So I started from the point of view where I was saying that spaces and architecture have a very direct effect on us, that we engage with them, that they are inhabited in many ways by us. So I think there's always something slightly shocking if you see an uninhabited structure. If you take human engagement out of these spaces and structures, there's something that's a little uncanny about architecture. There seems to be a trend at the moment um, on, I think the Huffington Post particularly seems to be throwing up on the internet an awful lot of abandoned spaces and places that have been recorded photographically. Um, and there seems to be a real kind of cultural interest in engaging with these forgotten spaces and places. So in the last four weeks I've seen slideshows of abandoned Disney theme parks, abandoned shopping malls in America, and the, I think the really kind of sinister one was the ten... I think it's the 10 most abandoned morgues, and I can't remember whether that was in America or worldwide, but they were pretty incredible as, as places that have just been left. Um, but demand sort of really plays with this narrative of spaces that are not inhabited. So you get things like this staircase, um, which is, you know, like a another institutional staircase, really you get kitchen scenes with coffee makers, toasters, bowls, bread baskets, sometimes with dirty dishes in the sink, sometimes not. So that sort of traces of things that you've left behind. You get abandoned offices, photocopiers ready to make their next copy, but not. And you get corridors. Now there's something extremely evocative about an empty corridor anyway, um, and I think demands corridor absolutely crystallises that because, are we back there? No? Because, um, as you may have noticed as I just flicked through those images, there's something very off about Demand's installations. Um, is anyone thinking that there's something a bit off kilter about these images? Or am I just imprinting that on you? Okay, I'm just going to say that for you. There's something a bit off kilter about these images. Um, and it's because they're all constructed from paper. So every single one of them has been built out of construction paper. So they come from two dimensions, they're created as three-dimensional sets, and then they're photographed, becoming technically two-dimensional again, but maintaining that illusion of a three-dimensional space that you could walk through. And of course, with demands work, you simply can't never could, they don't exist, they are paper. Um, the thing with demand is that the scale of these is huge, actually. If you ever see an installation of, of Thomas Demand's work, um, they're about the same size as the whiteboard behind me. And because they're so large scale, you're located in front of rooms that look real in the kind of dimensions that look like architectural dimensions that you're used to engaging with. Um, so it's more than just a trompe l'oeil trickery of dimensions, I think. There's something really uncanny and psychological that happens when you're stood in front of a demand photograph. And once, even once you've realised the trick, that these are not in fact spaces, that they're constructed, um, you still want 
to identify with them. You still want to engage with them. You don't have to actualize them actively in the way that we've seen for things like the area of interstiptic um, or the Amuatinus tabernacle diagram. But there's something that's outside of that lived experiential awareness of a space, like the room we're sitting in now, where we know what a chair is, we know what the table is, we know what this room is doing in terms of of how we're engaging with it. I'm stood here talking to you, gesturing wildly, and you're sat very patiently listening to me. Um, and there's nothing terribly frightening here. We know what a lecture room looks like. But when we're presented with a space that is a little off, that there's something unexpected there, it really throws us, I think, culturally, um, because we expect architecture to behave, and what happens when it doesn't? I think that's an interesting question. So to sum up and leave you a bit of time for questions, um, architecture is complicated. I think that's really my point here. Architecture, space, place, these are complicated constructs that affect us, that change us. It's not just us producing them. In many ways, these architectural spaces inscribe themselves on us. Um, and that they need to be thought about, whether it's in terms of how we understand these spaces in terms of their dimensions, in terms of spaces that we can engage with coherently and conceptually, or um, in terms of how these constructed, appropriated, created art installations make us question our assumed relationship with space, make us rethink what we know about architecture and place. I think all of that is incredibly interesting and quite important to think about. So as a final sort of um, plug, I guess, for two-dimensional architecture and three-dimensional space or three-dimensional architecture and two-dimensional space, whichever way you want to slice that, um, if this has got you thinking, there's an exhibition on at the moment at the National Gallery curated by um, Dr. Amanda Lilly from Art History here in York. Um, called Building the Picture, which is a much more specific timeline than I've given you today. It's, it's just about Renaissance painting, but it's all about getting you to rethink what we know about architecture in paintings and whether these things are just benign and beautiful backdrops or whether, in fact, they may have much more to tell us. So I'm going to leave it there and say thank you for listening, but I'm very happy to take questions for the last ten minutes or so.